Uh, hello. Uh, thank you, Anna, for your introduction. So today I'm going to talk a little bit about why I'm here and what happened to me. Actually, everything happened in 2018 before actually Bolsonaro's election. So it was, I think it was a kind of a preparation about what's happening right now in Brazil. So as Anna said, I work at Vice for the last six years. And I used to focus my work mainly on about sex working in Brazil, uh, pornography and prostitution, politics. I used to write a lot about true crimes, uh, human rights. And then for the last two years, I started to talking about far right movements in Brazil. So Vice, just to give a little bit of more context, uh, we are not as big as in the United States and the UK. Actually, we have a really small office in Brazil. I'm the only journalist at Vice right now. And so what we thought about it is that, is that okay, we don't have much resources to do a lot, of, uh, a lot of articles, so let's talk about things that people are not looking at in Brazil. So in my case was to talk about what's happening on far-right groups on the internet. So this led me to Dogolashe. Uh, sorry, I'm a better journalist than PowerPoint maker, so... <laughs> but Dogolashe mainly, what can I say, is that it was created in 2012, between 2012 and 2013, is an online hate group of the likes of 4chan and 8chan. Maybe you, you ever heard about it. And basically, Jay, like the reason that they exist is to ex uh, spread hate online against minorities, especially uh, black people, women, feminists, and the LGBT community. And of course, they're really hostile against journalists. Um, so Dogalashan existed on the surface web. It was really easy to get in there. It, it was kind of an online forum where lots of anonymous people just go there and start saying like really bad things about everybody. And it was created by a guy called Marcelo Valli. Uh, this guy is a, he's like active for the last 10 years in Brazil. In 2009, for example, he got arrested after operation of, uh, for the federal police because he was the, actually the first one, the first Brazilian that got convicted by the crime of racism online. So that's kind of his reputation. And then like, he managed to like, escape the convictions, uh, what happened in 2000 and, sorry, 2009. And he kept doing it, just saying, you know what, fuck it, I can do anything what I want, the law enforcement can do anything against me. So he created Dogolashan in 2012. And what Dogolashan do also, uh, besides spreading hate, is that when you are considered an enemy of Dogolashan, which could be, you can be anybody, like you can be just a feminist or somebody that just criticized them online, uh, they just create blogs and like, and they do social media posts, like spreading kind of this fake news about you, like saying really like racist things or spreading like child pornography, and they use your name to do that. So they destroy completely your reputation. I know like three or four people actually that a couple of years ago, every like their life was almost destroyed because of this kind of blog posts. Or like this kind of blogs they created. So the good news is that on 2018, the federal police did a massive operation and finally Marcelo was arrested. He's now facing off more than 40 years uh, jail time um, because like of incitation of hate, possession of child pornography, he used to like, he used to say that I, I like child pornography, I had this a lot in my computer. Uh, terrorist uh, threats and many more things. Uh, but actually, like after Dogolashan, uh, Marcelo, Marcelo was arrested, Dogolashan is still active. They just moved from the surface web to the dark net. So it's still happening, and the police couldn't actually identify who are the other members of Dogolashan. So, but the police actually thought, no, this is enough. Like, we don't need to keep going. Like, we already arrested the leader, which was, was really important. But there's many more people online, and Dogolashan still does, does a lot of things. 
So this is what happens where I get here. I used to, you know, monitor Dogalashi on the surface web a lot. And after Marcelo was arrested, I did this article that got translated actually to Vice, uh, for Vice US because it got really big in Brazil. This is Marcelo. Um, so, like this article, I just explained what is Dogolashim, what are these online hate groups, and mainly uh, I think I, I, we can call them kind of the pre incels of Brazil. Like, we could say that. So, I did this article, and then my life became utter hell because I just became this character on Dogolashim. Like this female journalist, they're like distorting their visions and they're doing bad things against the Golashim. And then, like after I got this, like, I did this article like kind of, uh, a week ago, uh, a week uh, after this, I started to get death threats. So first, it was only like blog posts, like sorry, uh, a post on their forum, still on the surface web. Just saying, like, okay, who is this girl? Who is this journalist? What we can do against her? And then the first thing was the doxing. Uh, so doxing basically is when people gather your personal information that is available online, or not online, it depends, but in my case it was. Uh, so they gather everything uh, they could find about me online, and they just did a, like this really massive uh, post on their forum with my father's address, with where my sister goes to work, saying they're going to rape my sister, saying they're going to kill my father. And then the doxing turned into emails, threatening my co more colleagues, my family, and of course myself. And then they had some blogs, and they also started to write about, uh, about my, me, saying that I support child pornography and like many things. And then also I received some emails, some weird emails, which was actually phishing attempts. Like they're trying to hack my device and get access to my emails. So this is, uh, this is a blog post that was actually the doxing that happened against, uh, against me. So this is like, I, I don't know if you can read it, but it's, it's a lot of links. Like they have like my brother's name, my little sister's name, and like my Vice articles, my Medium, uh, my Medium posts, Tumblr, and this, this here, like this over here, these all are court files, like really basic court files about like, I don't know, uh, things about, uh, so they gathered this, this is our public information that's easily find online, and through this they could find my, my, the address for my father. So it was really scary. And so this is a dog scene, and this is one of the first emails that I got from them. So basically he's just saying that uh, the person that wrote this, he signed with their enemy name on it, but I know it's, in the, it's not him. And so he just said, attention, I will kill you, I will pay like 5,000 5, reais, which is 1,000 euros or something to a hitman to put a, a bullet in your face. Please stop, stop talking about us. We are responsible for school shootings, and they are. Actually, in 2011, a school shooting, a massive school shooting happened in Rio. Uh, like, the shooter came into a school and killed, I think, 14 uh, kids. Most of them were girls. Were girls. And like this, this school shooter actually like there's really uh, strong suspicions that they went to Marcelo and Dogolashan to ask for help. No, before Dogolashan, I'm sorry, but they went to Marcelo actually to ask for help. So this is like a really nice email that sent me like saying that they're going to kill me, and they also put we'll put a bomb on Vice. And so when I got this, my first instinct was. You know what? I don't care. Like, I won't do anything. This is not that bad. There's so many cases about this. But then, like, when the emails got more and more regular on a daily basis, uh, then Vice, they actually reached me. My editor reached me and said, you know what? No, we need to go to the police right now. We need to do something about this because we don't know what can happen. 
and they were right, of course. Uh, so I went to the police and it was something really, really exhausting to go through law enforcement in Brazil because they don't care. They don't care about digital crimes. They don't have the necessary knowledge to deal with this. So it was like I was looking at the investigator of the civil police, which is the one that does investigations in Brazil. They just look at me and say, yeah, yeah, it sucks. It was mostly like this. And I just got lost. I mean, I thought, you know, I don't know what I do, what I'm going to do, because I want to do, continue doing my work. I want to keep reporting about them, about Dogolashan, after all, because they are still active. But, I mean, Vice, for obvious reasons, they just came to me and said, you know what, you need to stop a little bit, because we don't know what can happen. And I did. I hated it, but I stopped doing it. And then I got into the security training, that's why I'm here. Because a friend of mine, uh, she's, she's Brazilian, uh, and she works as an editor at Global Voices. She just sent me the link uh, about this program, scholarship program in Berlin, saying, oh my god, this is exactly what you're facing right now. Like, you should apply. And I did. And one thing that I, I, like, I want to stress about what I learn on security training, which was really helpful for my uh, work. We're going to do that. I'm going to talk about this more after on our, the, the next talk. But basically, like the security training gave me basic knowledge about what tools that I can use to be protected and stay anonymous when I keep like monitoring this kind of hate groups that I, that I do. So basically it was like basic things like, okay, how can I get in in the dark net? How can I stay untracked? How can I, you know, be, how can I avoid phishing attempts? How can I be more, you know, more aware about what my enemy can do? So this was really important and empowering, if I, I'm allowed to use that word, was really empowering for me. Because then, like, I could go back to Brazil after three months. I came back on January 2nd uh, to Brazil. And then like, I kind of decided, no, I will not stop talking about them. Like, I need to keep doing this. So one major thing happened when I came back. Uh, on March 12th, a school shooting happened in Sao Paulo. So school shootings are not... Uh, as normal as it is in the United States. <laughs> it's not like super common. We had like, we can count like five for the next, uh, for the last 10 years or something. It's not super common. But Susanna's school shooting was something really shocking because it just, uh, like they got, they, it was two shooters. They used to attend this school. Uh, Susanna is a district of Sao Paulo which is where I live, Sao Paulo. And they just got in, and they start shooting everybody, and like eight minutes later, they shot themselves. Like in, I remember that like on the morning of March 12th, I got um, a photo through WhatsApp of them dead on the floor. And what they were wearing, like their outfits, was exactly like the Columbine shooters, exactly. And I remember watching, like, seeing this photograph, and something came to me, and I, I thought, I need to go on Dogolashan. And Dogolashan was already working on the dark net. Uh, using my knowledge, <laughs> what I learned about the dark net and how to use Toa browser, which is really uh, simple, actually. I got there, and this post was there. This post, this was made 24 hours before the, sh the school shooting. This is a photo, a photo edit of the shooters of Columbine, and they had dog heads. The dog actually is the symbol of Dogolashen. And then they translated uh, the song uh, Pump Up Kids for uh, Foster the People, which is a song that uh, talks about the Columbine massacre. And they put there and say, be aware, something was gonna happen. And it did. And people were celebrating there. And then I just saw that and said, no, I need to write this article because people need to know about this. 
and I did. And I don't, I'm not. I'm, I didn't put it here because it didn't got translated. So I think it's worthless to put it here. But mainly, yeah. Once again, Dogal Ashan was behind a massive school shooting again in Brazil. So this is one of the shooters. He's using like his clothes were really exactly like Columbine. Even the watch that one of them used like here on the wrist. It's the same thing. It was really quite shocking, and people weren't, ex weren't expecting this because nobody was looking at the Golashan anymore. I was one of the few journalists that was actually monitoring them. And of course, like the article exploded. Sorry. The article just exploded, and people got really shocked because you know they thought that the Golashan was over. And of course, the threat, the threats came back again, and it was this I received like 24 hours after the school shooting in Suzano. Uh, one of them, I think, is the new moderator of Dogolashan, which we don't know who he, who he, uh, who he is, saying that stop writing about us, we will kill you, we will stay, we will we will kill everybody. Advice, you need to stop doing this again. And I still got this kind of emails. Sometimes they send me, sometimes they remember me and send me some emails, some really caring emails. But the, the, the thing is, this, like, I didn't stop that. I, it didn't stop me. I just, I went to the police again, doing that exhausting thing of going to law enforcement in Brazil and hearing them saying that we can't do anything. And one funny thing is that when I went to the police station to actually to do a, uh, to do a report about this death threat, the, the investigator, he looked at me and said, so, but how did you find out about this group? I said, no, it's it really easy. They operate on dark net. And he looked at me, like, he's the one who specializes in cyber crimes. <laughs> and he looked at me and said, dark net, are you a hacker? <laughs> And I was like, no, I'm not. But, but who gets in dark? The dark net is a hacker. It was really, it was not good. But yeah, but this, you know, like I think one thing good about the scholarship, it, it kept me going. And it kept me going to write about this. And one, this all happened, of course, this year. But one thing that I think it's really important to say is that this is what something that was a preparation about what's Bolsonaro today. Because Dogo Lashen and similar hate groups that operate online, they are Bolsonaro supporters. They were the ones, actually, that they were one of the groups that helped to create this myth image of Bolsonaro. You know, so, so I was watching this, I was monitoring this like one year and a half before the election of Bolsonaro. And so for me, it was, okay, I need to write about this because I think the youth of Brazil is on crisis because they are actually supporting a person that, you know, that it's against everything and it's against everything what stands for youth, actually. So that's why I did this massive article. This is an investigation after I spent monitoring the Dogolashem and other hate groups. So the translation is the infinite sadness of incels, a portrait of the youth in crisis in Brazil. Because as I said, Dogalaxia is something that we can call the pre-incels. And now they just call themselves incels, like they just took the name and say, yeah, yeah, we are incels. So incels, I don't know, like maybe you know, because there are quite a lot in the media, they are involuntary celibacy, celibacies. And they just like they just blame women for their problems, and they are really like they're really far right. They turn into the far right, and Bolsonaro stands like for this masculinity, that this big masculinity return or something. So Bolsonaro is of course like kind of their symbol. So I did this really massive investigation, and it was quite good for me. And people respected it a lot because nobody was looking about what's happening. So, one thing that I want to talk about, of course, uh, just to finish uh, what I'm talking about, is a little bit of what happens when you got attacked by online trolls, which is hell, 
because there's at the beginning you don't think that there's much you can do. So doxing is hell because whenever it's done, it's done. Like you never know how many informations that you have online. Like I used the internet since I don't know, it's 2012 or 2001. So I like it was kind of a surprise to see I have all this material about myself on it online. But I think the rule number one or zero, if you want to talk about this, never engage, never engage with trolls, because what the Golashem wants and what online trolls want is your attention. It's everybody's attention. So I just I never never replied anything, and I never spoke about this. After at least before my uh, my training, I never spoke about this on social media. I think it's something really important to do because you will be empowering them if you engage with them. So also, of course, like keep your personal profiles online if you know that you're going to be tracked down or you're going to be targeted. Actually, just keep everything private. It's the more they know about you, better. But I think. Everybody should kind of follow this. And uh, one thing that helped me a lot also, that I learned also during the, the training, uh, Google yourself and see how many personal information that you have available online. And Google has actually a form that you can fill. I'm not saying that Google is great, but they actually has this form. They have this form that you can fill and just put down your person uh, and say that you want to take down some of your information that you have. Um, and also, like for me, uh, it was really, really important to enable two-factor authentication. Just something, you know, for security reasons. And also, uh, for me, it was really important to create the safety net. Because uh, safety net, I mean, people around me. Because the police couldn't help me, but then, like, I surrounded myself with people that could actually help me. So I had, for example, after the training, I had the help of Report Hunegrensen, but also I had my family, I have other journalists that realized that this was serious. I had also, like my work, they were, my advice was really helpful when it, when it came uh, down to this. So, yeah, I think that's some of my tips. We can go through this, you can also ask me about this, but... One thing also, uh, as I said, what happened to me was a preparation about what's happening right now to Bolsonaro, because uh, the Bolsonaro supporters are doing similar things that Dogolashen do. So they spread, they do doxing, they spread misinformation about journalists, and they have a, a bot army, a really helpful bot army. They just attack you constantly when you do an article and you do a criticism against the government. So it's really, really helpful. Uh, the way I think like maybe Bolsonaro supporters learn a lot with Togolashan activities. Uh, I, I think I think so. And one thing that people doesn't talk a lot about this, but I think there's a big dehumanization of journalists because you became like when you're targeted by Bolsonaro's government or their supporters, you became kind of this kind of this character, this meme, and people don't see you anymore as a human being. They just seem, see you as like this Twitter profile, and they just they just don't care, you know, about what's going on with you. So there's journalists from the mainstream media that they face attacks online every day. So there's every day thousands of people just commenting and saying, uh, just posting awful things about them. So this is a way, I think, to you know to prevent journalists to keep doing criticism again against Bolsonaro. Uh, yeah, like since he got elected, for example, and he got elected on uh, the end of October 2018, uh, he made 99 attacks against the Brazilian against the Brazilian press, and mostly against Folha de São Paulo, which is a very big uh, newspaper in Brazil, and also TV Globo, uh, Rede Globo which is the most traditional media that we have in Brazil. Like, so, also, like, of course, traditional media, which is kind of funny, what's happening in Brazil, because if, if I was doing this talk in 2018, I would probably say, uh, do some lots of criticism against traditional media, because, you know, they have their interests, it's a monopoly, 
some families own traditional media in Brazil. But now I'm super, I'm defending their work like every day because they're doing journalism. After all, they're, they're doing, they're reporting about the government, they're just not, uh, so, sorry, they're reporting about the government, they're doing their job, so I'm defending them every day. It's really quite, quite funny, like the twist that happened. And one thing also that people usually don't know about this, so Bolsonaro doesn't rely on traditional media, so he doesn't give interviews, like he just, he just gives interviews to, to media that are like openly supporter of his government. So, if, so what he does, if you want to hear about what he has to say about, uh, to say about his government, he does live feeds on Facebook every Friday, uh, where he talks like with no filters uh, uh, for their supporters and the Brazilian nation. Also, is where the here where he criticizes journalists and where he incites people actually to go after journalists. So, and also I think since 2013, because we have lots of demonstrations that happened in 2013, I think the general public of Brazil, the like the Brazilian nation, they started to trust a little bit less on traditional media, and I think it was. What, one of the reasons of fake news, like the spreading of fake news, because now, for example, my father, like last year, he used to send me some links, like of completely crazy websites, like I've never heard about it. It was obviously fake news, but he said, you know what? I don't trust Global. I don't trust Folha de São Paulo. I don't trust the traditional media. Like we need to, you need to see the alternative media because they're talking the truth. And uh, it, it was quite crazy to hear about this because it used to be what I said about the traditional media when I was younger, but now it's completely changed. Um, so I have a video actually that I want to show you guys because this video illustrates a lot about how Bolsonaro uh, deals with journalists. And I think I edited it. Um, wait, wait. Sorry. Já. Bom dia, boa noite. Não sei, me desculpem. Ei, família, meu aqui. Eu prefiro ver do que responder uma pergunta idiota de você. Então respondendo. Me passa para você. Outra pergunta, por favor. Vamos falar de Brasil e de Goiás. Mas, já sei qual é a tua pergunta. Para a gente entender, por que o senhor não, não gostaria de responder sobre essa ação? Outra pergunta? Mais nada? Obrigado. Presidente, como o senhor avaliou as questões envolvendo o ministro Sérgio Moro? Pois é, eu tenho que perguntar. Obrigado. Se é para continuar a pergunta desse padrão, vai acabar a entrevista. Vai acabar a entrevista. Na foto. Tá. Fez o comentário que o cara não anula, não é. O meu comentário que eu falo é para não insistir nesse tipo de postagem. Centenas. Tchau, senhor. Não, 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 esse da foto tem que fazer. E não contratar qualquer uma, qualquer um para ser jornalista. Para ficar sem ver na discórdia e ouvindo besteira. Perguntando besteira, por aí publicando coisas nojentas. Eu, só... eu sou uma pessoa do diálogo, pode ter certeza disso. Tanto é que me declarando aqui, estou apaixonado por você. É. 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 Bom dia. Parabéns, a Folha agora contratou uma pessoa que sabe fazer perguntas. Parabéns. Por tudo. Estamos recuperando a confiança no mundo e vocês, TV Globo, o tempo todo infernizo a minha vida, porra! Onde vocês querem chegar, eu sei! Vocês não têm vergonha na cara! Essa patifaria 24 horas por dia contra a minha pessoa! Agora Maria e Franco querem empurrar para cima de mim! Quem vocês pensam que são? Eu sei quem vocês são, vocês são canalhas! Patifes! 
não são patriotas, não pensam no Brasil. E bem, Globo, vocês tiveram acesso a um processo que, que segue em segredo de justiça, né? Vocês têm que ser investigado tocante a isso. Classy, right? So this last, uh, this last video, like this uh, excerpt, is, is from the, his live feed that he actually criticized a lot uh, TV Global because uh, his family has some connections with the murdering of uh, uh, Marielle Franco. She got murdered uh, last year. So then he, uh, he, he was in Saudi Arabia and he, he, he recorded this live feed just saying everything. So I think that's it. <laughs> Thank you for uh, presenting us like the situation in Brazil. Um, and now I think we can go over for like a round of questions and answers. Um, maybe I can start with a question to you, because you told us um, like also about Bolsonaro and about like his treatment to the press and also that connection from his supporters with kind of the those extremists of Dogolashan. And then I would uh, like to ask you, maybe you can elaborate on um, how has the situation changed after Bolsonaro is now elected as a president? Have there been more attacks? How have those uh, groups now acted? Um, yeah. So Douglas Shen, actually, after Marcelo's arrest, he, he weakened, uh, weakened a lot. Uh, but they actually keep doing, keep sending death threats against congresspersons in Brasilia, which is the capital of, of Brazil. Uh, the same thing, like the same uh, way of doing it, just uh, saying we're going to kill you, is a try they're trying to intimidate people. So I think like, not the Golashen, but other kind of uh, hate groups are more empowered about Bolsonaro's election, especially because there's a researcher, uh, she's really good, uh, her name is Adriana Dias, she studies for the last uh, more than 10 years about uh, neo-Nazis in Brazil, And she told me that there's more than 300 groups active, neo-Nazi groups active in Brazil. And most of them are Bolsonaro supporters. So this is something that I'm really worried about. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I can imagine that. So um, maybe you can give another round for the public. Um, if you have some questions, please feel free to ask them. Thank you. I would want to understand, Marie, um, when you had the trolls on your case and you went to the police and you didn't get any reprieve from them, please could you tell us, is there no law in Brazil that maybe compels the police to assist um, you as a victim? And maybe on a follow-up to your case, to date, nothing has been done. They haven't found any lead or anything. Maybe just a bit of clarity on that. There's actually good, very good laws against cyber crimes in Brazil. That's, that's, that's the thing about Brazil. We have very good written laws, but law enforcement and the justice system doesn't work. Like, it's really, it's not helpful at all, this kind of situation. So, no, they, they never did a kind of follow-up. Uh, because, you know, uh, what they said to me is like, okay, so this group, it operates on Darknet, and before on surface net they told, told me kind of the same thing. Because they're anonymous, we can track them. So we can actually follow up. So I never got a call for them. I file a report, of course. I'm waiting until this day to see if they're doing something. But no, so the police is something that I never counted on. Uh, if it was actually like physical threats, or like if I knew who was the person that actually was threatening me, I think, yeah, the police will, will be like, they will act different, of course, because you have somebody that you, can, you have proof, you have somebody that actually you can go after. But when it comes to digital crimes, like Brazil is still very far away from like, you know, to, to help with that, unfortunately. Thank you very much for your reporting and for this 
video, and I know that Donald Trump is a sheep against Bolsonaro, I think. But um, what I want to ask you, um, what do you think about activism and journalism? I think, uh, am I wrong when I say you as a journalist have to be an activist too? Or do you think that activism is okay in journalism to do something against these structures? Uh, I think it's 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 okay to be an activist and a journalist. This is this was something like last year. I would never say say that you know I'm an activist or something. I still not I don't consider myself an activist. But activists and journalists together, they're really important in Brazil because, for example, journalists, activists, they are the ones that actually uh, they. They're not sorry, <laughs> but they, uh, for example, uh, jur activists, journalists, they actually denounce uh, police crimes against uh, black people in Brazil. So we we need to we still count a lot of, uh, with this. So I don't know. I'm not an activist, but if it's necessary, like against this type of, type of people, I think so. Yeah. How was the solidarity with the journalists while you were facing these kind of threats? I, I, sorry, I didn't get the, the beginning of the question. How was the solidarity between journalists when you, while you were uh, facing threats? That's kind of things. Uh, this is an interesting question because at the beginning, uh, people were like, you know what, it's kind of your fault because you left your personal information available, like you should have known, you shouldn't have, like you should have expected this. People quite didn't quite understand why I was so worried about this. And at the beginning I was even, I, I wasn't actually worried about this. I thought, you know, that this is nothing. Like, like worst thing happens to journalists around the country or in other countries, so. But then, like, after I did this training, uh, uh, other colleagues from different uh, media outlets, they came to me and said, you know what, like, I thought it wasn't that serious, but actually it's really important what you did. Because after the school shooting that happened this year, in March, I think people actually saw, like, who we were dealing with. So, yeah, it was a, a mix, a mix back, but now I think they are more, they have more solidarity. About this questions. So, some more questions of you? Okay, well, okay, yes, at once. So, so, my question is that uh, what was the role of uh, Facebook and Twitter in terms of taking down the content of these eight groups? Like, did they cooperate when you or the government reported the content to them? So I never, uh, be, uh, because most of the, the, the things that they spoke about me was on their online forum, which is kind of similar to 4chan and 8chan. I never actually had to request to take down to Facebook or Twitter, for example. But I mean, because Dobalashan has this fame of being this really well-known uh, hate group, I think like at least Twitter, they are more reactive when it comes to Dobalashan. They actually take down some contents of the Dobalashan. But on Facebook, and you know what, like Facebook, lots of hate groups that are operating on Brazil, they, they function on Facebook, on private groups. And uh, Facebook doesn't care at all. Like, we are already like asked them, you know, can you say something about this? Because there's like, I just tracked like 10 groups, have hate groups that are working on Facebook, and they never even replied to me. So that's, that's this problem, you know. So we could take like one more question, if there's something that you want to ask still for Marie. Yes, please. Sorry, Folia de San Paulo in uh, TV Globo. Yeah. Um, because as you said, there was earlier there was a lot of criticism related to, to these uh, media, but now this has changed, and I've heard that from another journalist before. So I just wanted to understand 
Do you defend them now because they are under attack from Bolsonaro? Or have they really have, have they really changed their work and their behavior and what they report? Uh, I think both. A little bit of both. Uh, of course, I defend them because of Bolsonaro attacks, because we need to have a free press uh, working in, in Brazil. And press, is, it does not belong to the state. Like, traditional media does not belong to the state in Brazil. So, but still a monopoly. It has, like, few families that owns them, so they have their interests. But I think, like, after Bolsonaro got elected, Folha on Globo, they, they were shocked. You know, because they didn't expect the escalation of violence and, you know, this aggressive behavior of Bolsonaro. And I think Bolsonaro, like Folha and Globo, they are liberals, we, we can say that, liberals. They weren't expecting, you know, this completely conservative and chaotic government. And so I think they changed a little bit. They're, they're trying to do a more responsible work when it comes to politics. But I mean, before Bolsonaro got elected, for example, in Dilma's Rousseff coup that happened, like, it started in 2014 and then in like 2016, 15, they were supporters of the coup. Like, so they actually helped a little bit of, of like, this comes, uh, this situation, uh, this situation to happen in Brazil. But now, I, I don't, I'm not gonna say they, they are, they're regretting what they did, like, on um, uh, previous years. Yeah, they change a little bit. I think they're more responsible. But they still have their interests because they don't like Bolsonaro, but they defend, for example, the economic plan of Bolsonaro, which is completely neoliberal. So.